So good. Well, we are currently in a series called The Valley. If you haven't been with us, uh, what we're talking about in this series is just, it's just real life moments, real life situations, real life valley times that we all go through. Because we don't want to be a church that doesn't talk about them. We want to be a church that talks about these moments because each and every one of us will go through a valley at some time in our lives, more than likely multiple valleys. So we don't want to be a church that shies away. We want to be a church that talks about them, but then speaks the life of Jesus into it, the light of Jesus into those valley moments so we know how to walk through the valley. So in week one, we had our lead pastor, Miles Paladin, down, and he uh, spoke on the valley of doubt. And I just loved what he said, that doubt is not the opposite of, of faith. Doubt is not the absence of faith. It is a vehicle to drive us to greater faith. That is what doubt is. Doubting Thomas, even though he doubted that Jesus had returned, he still turned up and then he became a martyr because he knew Jesus and he led him to greater faith. Then last week we had Pastor Nikki from our Cairns location down and she spoke on the valley of anxiety. And I just love that as a clinical psychologist, she is able to understand the mind and, and the, just the physical world that we live in. But then as a Christian, fully understands the supernatural. And with all of that knowledge, she's able to pull it together and help us when we come across anxiety, when we come across fear, to be able to walk through that valley. And today, I'll be talking on the valley of loss. And this valley, if we are honest with ourselves, we have all walked through. Every single one of us has lost something or someone at some time. Just look at the past three years. When, when COVID came around, we literally lost a year of our life. We can't get that back. But loss is so much broader than just maybe what we think. It could be relational. Your marriage may have broken down. Your partner may have left you. Your kids may have walked away. Your parents may shut you out. It could be financial. You may have lost your job. You've just made that one wrong investment. You may have lost your house. It could be your health. You could be going through a, a chronic illness that, that you just can't see the other side and it's caused you to, to lose a part of your life that you can't get back. It, you could be faced with a, a diagnosis that has been given you recently and you're just in, down the end of the valley. It just looks like loss. It could be your reputation. People are talking behind you, behind your back. It has caused a, a loss in your areas of your life. And it could be the big one, life. You may have lost someone close to you, a family member, a friend, a loved one. We have all gone through loss. But if we are not careful, our loss can turn into fear. Our loss can turn into fear of the unknown. If you've lost your job as the man in the house, you are fearful of being able to provide for your family. You've may lost a loved one. You don't know what life is going to look like on the other side. You've, you're fearful of what that looks like. If, you're, if your marriage is broken down, you're fearful of what the future brings. You're fearful of what's going to happen with your kids. If we are not careful, our loss can turn into fear. And I know that's what happened with me. Uh, most of you will know uh, my story. Uh, but when I was about uh, nine years old, um, uh, the, the man that I thought was my dad... Um, he, he left my mom, he, he divorced her, and then he demanded that she tell me that he was not my dad anymore. That he wasn't my biological dad, so I, I, I don't call him dad. The man that I'd been calling dad for nine years was no longer my dad. In that moment, I lost my dad, I lost my family, and I lost my identity. Because at that young age, you look to your parents to know who you are. But when that was removed from me, I didn't know who I was anymore. And at the time, I thought I was all over it. I'm like, it's all good. I'll find a new one. <laughs> but, you know, looking back on it, not, uh, not confronting it properly, not confronting it well, not confronting this loss the way Jesus wants us to confront it, it then bred in me a fear of abandonment. I was afraid of losing 
right? I had lost so much that I was afraid of losing anymore. So when I had people come close to me and I thought they might leave me, I cut them off. I was like, you're not going to abandon me. I'm going to abandon you first, right? I know a nine-year-old probably being a bit hard on myself, but that's what, that's, what I, that's what I went through. And I came to a place where I was just so fearful of the unknown, fearful of the loss that I put everything in place so I never had to lose again. And it wasn't until Jesus came and He spoke life into my valley that I was able to, to move through that. I was able to move through that fear and not fear people leaving me anymore. I was able to look at people and when, and when things happen, like people move, right? Like some of my best friends moved six hours north. People that I had been doing hard and, and, and rough life with really closely, they left. But in that moment, I was able to grieve. I was able to be upset, but we are still really good friends. And that is only because of what Jesus did in me. So whatever the valley that we are in, Psalm 23 tells us to not fear, right? He tells us, just don't fear. Just, you're going to be okay. Don't fear. I don't know about you, but when I step into my valley or if I've been in my valley for a long time, my first port of call is not to not fear. I am trying to do what I can to fix the situation. That's not where I go to. And what's so interesting about Psalm 23 is when we read through it, we realize that this was not written in a valley moment. David did not write this psalm when he was in the valley, when he was lamenting and he was crying out to God. No, no, no. He wrote this on the mountaintop. He wrote this when he was out of the valley. So how can David tell us, how can David tell us to not fear when he's on the mountaintop? Well, what, what he's doing is he's looking back on his valley and now he's directing us how we should live through the valley. Because the previous, the very uh, previous uh, Psalm, Psalm 22 verse 1, do you know how it starts? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is the words of a man going through a valley. That is a man going through a loss and sorrow and pain. He's just saying, God, where are you? I'm in my valley. I'm calling out to you. I'm asking you things and you are not showing up. So how, how are we meant to live a life of Psalm 23 when all we can feel and see is Psalm 22? How are we able to not fear in the valley when all we can see is our loss? All we can see is our valley. We cannot see the light at the end of the tunnel. It's just shadow after shadow and darkness. And it's more and more feels like that God has abandoned us. So we're going to jump into Luke, not Luke, to John 11, the story of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, they were, re- they were good friends of Jesus. They knew Jesus well. There's multiple stories of them uh, doing things together. But in this story, Lazarus, he falls ill. So Mary and Martha, they, they call for Jesus. They, go, they say, go get Jesus because we've seen him heal. So go get him. Go get him. So when Jesus finally hears the call from Mary and Martha, he basically says, I'll get there. I'll get there in my time. I'll get there. So Mary and Martha, back at the bedside of their brother Lazarus dying, a day goes past, another day. He ends up dying, and then another day goes past, and 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 he's still dead. I believe there are people in this room that that's where they're at. They've entered the valley. They've called on Jesus, but they've heard silence. They've called, they've prayed, they've petitioned to Jesus, yet they feel like they've just had silence, that they've had no answer. And then the valley has gotten worse and it's gotten worse and it's just a time and time, but Jesus has still not turned up. But the funny thing about Mary and Martha even though Jesus wasn't with them, even though they couldn't see Jesus coming, Jesus was on his way. And I feel like that's for some people in the room. Jesus is on the way. You might be in the valley. You might not be knowing what's going on, but Jesus is on his way. He's on his way to you to pull you out of that valley because he's not just going to 
to walk through the valley with you. He has the power to pull you out of the valley. He is on the way. So verse, uh, so after four days of, of Lazarus being dead, Jesus finally turns up. He finally rocks up. And then we, we, we get into verse 20 and it says, So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met with him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give it to you. In this moment, in one breath, Martha is saying, God, where were you? I called you and you did not come. And in the very next breath, she said, but I trust you, but I know who you are. She goes on to say, you are Jesus. You are the King of Kings. You are the Lord. You are the one that we've been waiting for. You are the Son of God. What Martha is doing here is she's grieving with hope. She's grieving with the eternal hope that she knows that Jesus can do anything. And Jesus will. Because if he asks the Father, it will happen. So in this moment, she looks to Jesus. She says, I know I am grieving, but I'm going to look to you. I'm going to look at you and know you for who you are. And we see that in Psalm 23, the first three verses. He's saying, you are my shepherd. You are my restorer. You are my protector. You are my comforter. You are my provider. That is who you are. And even in Psalm 22, when he starts off, when David starts off saying, Why, where are you? You have forsaken me. We then get to verse 22. And what does he say? I'll get there. In verse 22, David says, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Despite his circumstances, despite what was going on around him, despite what he saw, Martha and David said, no, 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 I'm going to look to you and I'm going to know who you are. Because you are the King, you are the Lord, you are able to do more abundantly than what we have planned, more abundantly than what we can think. And that's why sometimes when we sing, we can sing a bridge over and over again. We can sing a chorus over and over again. Because we can know it up here, but sometimes it takes a little while to get down here. We can sing songs like Graves into Garden. It's like, I know you will turn my morning into dancing. I know you will turn that grave into a garden. I know you will give me beauty from ashes. My shame will turn into glory. We can know it cognitively, but do we really know it in our heart? We need to sing it over and over again until it stirs within us, our spirit, so we know that that is who Jesus is. He will turn our grave into our garden. He will turn our morning into dancing. He will turn our beauty, our ashes, into beauty. That is who He is. The first step is we need to declare who Jesus is, and we need to declare His name over our situation. That's why we sung that before. We're going to shout Jesus from the mountain. We're going to shout Him. We're going to speak the name of Jesus. That's where we started. We're declaring Jesus over our situation. That is the first point. But we need to be careful because I've heard this far too many times. We don't need to push aside our grief to hope in Jesus. I've heard that before. It's like, oh, if you want to hope in Jesus, you need to just forget about your grief. Just brush it under the rug and then that, that's when you can come to Jesus. Because, but Jesus, hope in Jesus is not a feeling. Hope is Jesus. It is knowing who He is. It is knowing that He is your provider, that He is your comforter. He is, it is knowing who Jesus is because it's not a feeling. It is a person. That is what hope is. So it's not brushing our grief under the rug and then being able to come to Jesus. It's taking our grief and bringing it to Jesus, right? We don't need to think that we can't, we can, we can't, we can be fearless in the valley, therefore we can't feel in the valley. No, no, no. We need to be both fearless and feeling in the valley. That is what Martha did. She brought her grief to Jesus, but then she said, no, but I know who you are. And then in walks Mary. She finally decides to come in verse 32. Now, when Mary came to Jesus, to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother 
would not have died. See, she's saying the same words as her sister Martha. She's saying, if you would have been here, he would not have died. But what does she do? What does she, what does she do? She weeps. She falls at the feet of Jesus and cries. And in this moment, Jesus, Jesus doesn't scold her. Jesus doesn't tell her to get up and get over it. No, it says, looking upon her weeping, looking upon all the others that are weeping, he was deeply moved and greatly troubled. And then verse 35, the most shortest, one of the most shortest verses in the Bible, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. When we bring our grief to Jesus, it's not just to get it over with, it is to bring it to Jesus and he will grieve with you. He will grieve with us. When we bring our grief to Jesus, when we cry with Jesus, He will also cry. And we can have confidence that He will do that. We can have confidence that He will be compassionate. We can have confidence that He'll be there for us. In Hebrews 4, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet Without sin, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. We can be confident that we can come to Jesus and He'll feel our pain. Because He has felt everything that you have felt. He has gone through everything that you have gone through. He has gone through every temptation, every pain, every sorrow. But He's come out the other side, perfect, glorifying God. That is who he is. Even in Isaiah uh, 53, it says, it says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows. See, Isaiah, before Jesus came, said that that man that's going to come, he will know our pain. And then when Jesus was on earth, He wept with those who wept. And then when he left and went back to heaven, the disciples and the apostles were certain and confident that when they cry, Jesus will cry with them. We are to grieve with Jesus because when we grieve with Jesus, he will grieve with us. In Matthew 11, 28, it says, Come to me all who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My yoke is easy. Jesus is saying, bring me your sorrow. Bring me your loss. Bring me your pain. Bring me your grief, and I will carry it for you. See, a yoke, what a yoke did was it would uh, release pressure of another. So they would go over two bulls and then they would be able to plow or there would be a pull. So they would be sharing the load. See, Jesus is saying, my yoke is easy. When you get attached to me, you don't have to pull anything of mine. Right? That's, it's easy. It is light. But when you attach to me, bring me your grief. Bring me your sorrow and I will carry it for you. That is what we are doing when we are coming to Jesus. We don't need to sweep it under the rug. We don't need to put it aside. We need to bring it unto Jesus. We need to cry at His feet for He will carry our grief for us. So we are to grieve with hope and we are to grieve with Jesus. Now Mary and Martha, they did a lot of great things, but there's also some things that we can learn from. So in verse 23, Jesus said to Martha, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. See, See, Martha was looking into her future. She was looking into the eternal hope that she has. And we need to be always looking there. We need to be looking into the eternal hope because Jesus will return for His saints. Jesus will take us into eternity and we will live forever with Him. 
We need to be looking at that. But in this case, Martha did not think that Jesus could work in her now. She said, no, 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 it's all good. I know that he will rise one day. Even when Jesus went to try to raise Lazarus, Martha said, no, no, stop. It's okay. He's already dead. He'll rise eventually. Martha didn't think or didn't know that he wants to work in her now, that he wanted to work in her now. But Jesus can work in our now and Jesus will work in our now. When we bring our grief and our pain to him, he will work in our now. Because God will just not walk with you in your valley, but he has the power to pull you out. And I think there are some people in this room, that's where you are. You feel like you're looking at Jesus. You're like, I have the hope. I know that in the end, everything will turn out right. But, but just don't worry about now. I'm looking to the future. And there's many reasons as to why that could be. You may, may have prayed before, sought Jesus, asked him for things and just felt like he didn't come through. Felt like you've just been met with silence. And there's many reasons why we don't think that Jesus can work in our now. But the funny thing about a valley is that's where most life is. So with a valley, the water will run down the sides and it will sit in the bottom. And that is where the grass will grow. That is where life will grow. That is where we see flourishing in the valley because of the water that drips down into the center. See, it's not on the other side that Jesus wants to work. He doesn't want you to step out of your valley to then have your miracle. He doesn't want you to step out of your valley to then be transformed. He wants to work in your valley. See, it is in the valley where a grave will become a garden. It is in the valley where mourning will become dancing. It is in the valley where ashes will become beauty. It is in the valley where shame will become glory. Because we don't need to exit. We're not going to exit the valley with a grave. We're going to exit the valley with a garden. That is what the valley is for. We step into the valley and we believe that Jesus will work because He can work, not because of what your situation looks like, but because of what He's done in the past. He is the God of Abraham and He came through. He is the God of Jacob and He came through. The God of Moses, the God of Noah, and He's come through. And David and Solomon and Joel and Peter and Saul, every time that God had a promise, every time someone was in a valley, God came through. He can work in your valley. But Jesus, He needs to be our first. He needs to be our first. When we're in the valley, we don't go to our friends. We don't go to Instagram. We don't go to our phones. We come to Jesus. See, in verse 20, we see that when Jesus came to Mary and Martha, only Martha went. Mary stayed behind. She wanted to sit in her grief. She's like, I'm, it's not time for me to walk through my valley. I'm going to sit in my valley. I'm going to camp in my valley. I'll get there eventually. But then in verse 28, Martha comes back and she says, she says, Mary, the teacher is here and he is calling for you. He is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Who needs to hear that today? He is calling for you. In your valley, whatever you are going through, He is calling for you. In Revelation 3.20, it says, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice, open and I will come in and eat with Him. This is not to non-Christians. This is a letter to the church. This is a letter to Christians that have shut out God. A letter that, to Christians that have shut out Jesus. And He is standing there. He's saying, I am here. Let me in. In your valley, let me in. In your sorrow, let me in. In your pain, let me in. Come to Jesus first. And when we come to Jesus first, we can look to Jesus and we can know who He is and we can then grieve with Jesus and we can know that He will work in our valley because that is who Jesus is. So how? How did Mary and Martha find their way through the valley? How did David find his way through the valley. When he says, do not fear in the valley, what was it that caused them to be able to walk through the valley and see a miracle on the other side? It was an encounter with the living God. 
It was an encounter. And it wasn't a knowledge encounter. It wasn't a metaphysical encounter. It wasn't just, just reading the Bible and knowing God is there. No, no, it was a physical encounter. Mary and Martha both came and met with Jesus. David, he knew Jesus in Psalm 63. In Psalm 63, it says, So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary. I have looked upon you beholding your power and glory. See, for David, it wasn't a metaphysical knowledge. It was a physical knowledge. He had looked upon Jesus and he has beheld his power and his glory. Even when he was anointed by, uh, by uh, Samuel uh, to become king of Israel, it says that in that moment, the Holy Spirit came and cl- clothed him. The same Holy Spirit that clothed David for him to know that Jesus is with him is the same Holy Spirit that can live inside of us. And when the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, we will know that Jesus is with us. Because it says, I will not fear for you are with me. It's the back half of the, back half of the verse that tells us why we shouldn't fear. David had an encounter with the living God. He knew he was in his valley with him. Therefore, he will not fear. It's not, I'm going to not fear and then I'll encounter Jesus. No, I'll encounter Jesus. Therefore, I will not fear. And then in Romans 5, 5, it says that the love of God is poured out through the Holy Spirit. When we, are, when we encounter Jesus, when He fills us with Holy Spirit, when we, come into, when we come to His feet and grieve, He will pour out His Spirit onto us and then we will be filled with the love of God. It is in the encounter where we can grieve before Jesus and not fear in the valley. It's in the encounter where we can both be at the feet of Jesus and cry, yet despite our circumstances, know He is God. It is in the encounter where we can know that He is with us in the valley. It is in the encounter that we can walk through and grow in our valley. Because it says, even though I walk. We don't need to sit in our valley. We don't need to camp in our valley. When we encounter Jesus, it's time to walk. It's time to walk with Jesus, right? We don't sit in our valley, sulk in our sorrow. No, no. Jesus says, get up, put on my yoke. I will carry your burdens and we'll walk the other side together. Come on. Because we, when we face with fear, when we are faced with loss, we have a tendency to shrink back. We have a tendency to just say, you know what? I, I, I'm going to do less. Maybe that's cutting out some friends. Maybe that's just shutting yourself up in, the ro- in your room and wa- watching Netflix all day. Maybe that's stopping coming to church. It's like, I-, I just can't see people right now. But Jesus is saying, no, no, no. Encounter me. Don't sit. Take a step. Don't camp. Come and draw near. Don't retreat. Press in. So in a moment, that's what we're going to do. We're going to open up the altar and we're going to encounter that very same God. We're going to encounter Jesus, the one who who, who bore our sins on the cross, who paid the price that we could not pay and then rose again on the third day so we could live with Him in an eternity forever. And the funny thing is, is that when we become saved, when we come into a life with Jesus, we talk about this thing called sanctification right? We talk about becoming more like Jesus. But sometimes we think that that only means in obedience. We just, when we become like Jesus, it just means we're going to obey more. No, no, no. We become like Jesus in every aspect of our life. In healing, in our thought patterns, in our valleys, in our sorrows, in every single way, we are made more and more like Jesus, and that all happens in the encounter. If you haven't met this Jesus before, He wants to know you. He he wants you to open up the door to Him. He wants to come into your life and live with you. You may not know Him or you may be backslidden, but Jesus wants a relationship with you. You might have known Him before, but you may have stepped away. 
But Jesus wants you because Jesus loves you. That is the simple truth. He died on our cross. He bore our sins. He then rose again on the third day so that we could live with Him in heaven forever and be made more and more like Him for eternity. So with eyes closed, if that's you, if you just feel something in your heart saying, I I need this Jesus. I'm in a valley right now, but I know that this Jesus is the Jesus that can take me to the other side, that can stand with me and and can carry my burdens, can carry my grief. If that's you, if you want to start or or restart your relationship with Jesus, I just ask you right now to boldly raise your hand. Yep, I see that hand at the back. Come on. Amazing. Just give a couple more moments if there's anyone else that just wants, that just, it might be something inside of you. Your heart might be pounding. You just feel like Jesus is calling you home today. Awesome. Well, let's stand. We're going to pray. And then we're going to open the altar. Lord, I just pray for every single person in this room. And I pray for that one uh, brave person that, that says, I, I want to know Jesus. I want to come into relationship with the living God because I know that you died on the cross for my sins. That, that a payment that I could not pay, but you have paid it for me. You have set me free. And now I want to I step into the freedom that you have for me. So I pray for every single person in this room. I pray that they come into an encounter with the living God right now. In Jesus' name, amen.